And Dave Kaplan is, his name is synonymous with cellular agriculture. And one of the things I was thinking this morning is, is Dave really here or did we 3D meat print him here? <laughs> <laughs> which someday, Dave, you never know, right? You never know. I might be. Um, but, but we're so honored to have Dr. David Kaplan with us. He's definitely not only locally, nationally, but internationally known right now as a leader in the cellular agriculture space. And so he is going to give one of our spotlights, our research spotlights. These spotlights do not have a Q&A after them. They are meant as 15-minute research sort of surges at you that you can just process and think about, all right? So with that, Dave Kaplan, take it away. Thanks, Katie. Uh, first of all, great to be here. Get me out of Medford and downtown. It's been two years since I've done it. So thank you, Darian and Katie, for inviting me today. I have to say two things. First, for Rebecca, wherever she is, Darry only needs one day at the well. I probably need a full year to figure out what's going on up here. So uh, we'll be in touch. And for those of you who know Bob Langer well, as I do for decades, He's turned into a stand-up stand comedian. It's pretty, pretty impressive, you know, so, but it's great. So um, anyway, for today, my, my short talk, I just want to give you a sense of what the university is doing in the world of cell ag, because we think it's a really important direction we're going as a campus-wide effort to try and bring foundational science and engineering to this field. And it, it spans everything from our vet school to the nutrition school, engineering, biology, et cetera. So we're pretty excited about where we're going. Uh, uh, in the future. Uh, so for those of you who don't know the field, you can see sort of a definition up there. The simple way to say it, it's growing animals, or sorry, growing food without the animals. So we just need some cells from those animals, leave the animal alone, and on we go with the process. So you're probably all familiar with kind of the alternative options for foods that have been emerging over the last three to five years. Remarkable growth, unprecedented and unexpected throughout the industry as well as from the academic side. And you see these, whether it's Burger King or KFC or whatever, and these are sort of the first to hit the market, uh, incredibly popular, but a lot of red flags going forward. There's a lot of questions about nutritional uh, content and, and related things. You're just seeing scientific papers come out that look at sort of the profiles and where the needs are. So there's gonna be a lot of need going forward to improve these products so that consumers will still want them and they'll be uh, suitable. Along with that, though, back in about eight years ago, the first example of cellular agriculture hit, hit, hit the market. And this was from Mark Post over in, uh, in Europe. And Mark produced this uh, sort of cell-grown hamburger. And it was from bovine cells. There's a lot of other things in there that I won't talk about because they're not really appropriate for eating a hamburger. But nonetheless, it demonstrated to consumers that there's the potential to grow, use cells through what we call tissue engineering. So cells with matrices and bioreactors to create foods of the future as an alternative for uh, many of us. Um, the problem is, as with any new technology, this cost about $300,000, right, to grow enough cells to have something they could cook uh, in the newscasts and consume at the same time. So that's really the start of this whole field. So this field is embryonic in terms of where it is. And really at Tufts, we're trying to create sort of a foundation of the science and engineering that will underpin this field. And that's really where we're at with peer-reviewed data and related sort of inputs to help guide the field going forward. That includes the private sector as well as the academic sector and on. So this is the big picture cartoon-wise of what we're talking about, right? You take an animal on the left, it could be fish, crustacea, bovine, porcine, you, you name it, right? We harvest some cells with a biopsy, and then we go through the process from left to right, which is essentially isolating the right cells, expanding them, expanding them, expanding them, on and on and on. Create a scaffolding, so think of it as an architectural framework where the cells know what to do, they want instructions from us. And then finally, to the right, we get the food products that people may want to consume. The difference here between what you see with plant-based products like the burgers and KFC, these are not over-processed, right? These take the cells, they produce the tissues, and on they go into the right-hand side. So we, we don't over-process at all, and nutritionally, in principle, these foods should be the same as what comes from the animal or potentially better. So this is really the goal of the field. So left to right again, you see the plant-based on the left. Again, some issues with nutrition going forward, other additives, salts, and so on, red flags to be dealt with in time. 
We have fermentation-based technology in the middle, so ingredients to go into these processes. And on the right is what we're really focused on. All of the left and middle go into the right anyway, right? So the goal is to make hybrid products to keep the cost down initially, as well as use some of the ingredients from the fermentation approach as well. The problem is for the cell ag field, we have no demonstrated scale up yet, right? So costs are still high. Nutrition is questioned yet, and we have no idea how to scale to make meaningful quantities of food to help uh, consumers going forward as, a, as an alternative to animal-based uh, livestock and so on. So why is there such interest in this field? And that's sort of summarized here. You heard a little bit about that from the panel just before, but essentially, whether you're interested in dealing with population growth, animal welfare, um, food equity, uh, other things like food security, public health, and, and sustainability, you know, you all have a home here because that's what this field really addresses. So in a holistic way, you can really address all these issues if we do our job right. And having sort of a nascent field allows us to address things like food equity. There are ways to do this at a small scale, rural location, as well as in a city, and anything in between. So that's part of the goal for the program at the university to make sure that happens. The other big problem has been all the investment. I won't say it's a problem, but the other issue is uh, there's so much investment now in the field. You see new deals, VC and otherwise, hundreds of millions of dollars going into this field. The protein landscape is, is growing exponentially, which is fantastic, right? There's new companies starting in Boston. We just spun off one from our own lab, in fact. There's lots out in San Francisco, worldwide, everywhere, Europe, China, Singapore, et cetera. Um, however, up till recently, there hasn't been sort of the, uh, the foundational academic underpinning to make sure the right data is out there that's peer-reviewed to drive the field forward, to make sure decisions are being made on quality science and quality education. So that's our mandate for our center here at Tufts. And we're trying to work with companies, but also just work with publicly funded grants and agencies to make this happen. So that's really where we are today. And we're moving along, I would say, reasonably well as a starting activity. This is what we do, in case you've never seen the process. So I already mentioned some of this. You, on the left-hand side, we take our biopsy from a cow out of Tufts Veterinary School. And you see if we grow it up correctly at the bottom right, for those of you who ever did histology, you would know that looks like a absolutely beautiful state-of-the-art muscle bundle, muscle fiber, right? So it works. There's no mystery there. What doesn't work yet is how do we figure out how to make unstructured foods or highly structured foods? And those are things consumers will want to do. This is where we are today, right? We can grow a muscle bundle, as you see here, that's from our own lab, and we can use those bovine-derived cells to do it, but we're nowhere near what you see on the left-hand side. We have a long way to go, and that's part of the challenge of what the group and the, the university is working on, to address all those issues, also in the context of cost, scaling, and so on. We have developed also technology to scale fat, because fat obviously plays a huge role in uh, food taste and, and so on. And so it's hard to see here, but if you see the bottom of that plastic dish on the left, that's covered with fat cells that have grown. And we grow those from, from porcine, or we can grow them from other sources. And then all we do is scrape them up, cross-link them with traditional food binders, and you can make a pile of fat, if you will. You can sort of see it right there as a, as a blob. Okay, so technology is coming to do this. The really powerful part for cell ag is these cells are very accessible to manipulation. And there's two ways we do it. One is feed the cells different, for example, fatty acids. So you can control essentially the nutritional profile of those cells based on how you grow them. That has to be you know, complemented with cost and so on. And the other way I'll show you in a minute is we can certainly genetically engineer these cells as well. That may be good for some consumers and bad for others. That has to be worked out with consumer preferences and, and related issues going forward. So that's what this shows. We have lots of ways to engineer the cells if we wish by what we feed them or how we manipulate them genetically. And, and I don't have time to go through all these, but lots of ways to control nutrition, color, Texture, stability, storage, safety, et cetera, et cetera. The one example we published is this one, where we took uh, essentially a pathway to make a vitamin, which you've all seen. And this vitamin obviously exists in carrots already. And we engineered our bovine cells now to make vitamins you'd find in carrots. And the amazing thing, as you, you heard earlier from Bob, is when you produce these exogenous sort of 
vitamins in the, the cells themselves. The cells provide stabilization uh, to those otherwise sensitive nutrients. So we can cook the foods we grow from this, and the vitamins are still there and stable as antioxidants. So it, it points to how we can improve the safety, the health, and, and the stability of these foods going forward. The other thing we do that's a bit weird, so I accept people's squirmishness, is we care about insects, okay? So if you stay out of the Western world, insects are consumed all around the world, right? We just don't consume them much in the US or in Europe. And so they are an amazing treasure trove of cells to use to, to grow tissues and foods through cellular agriculture. And you already know the reason. You can find insects anywhere, right? So they are very non-fastidious in terms of what you need to feed them, care for them, and so on. And I gave you the list here. You don't need serum. You don't need special growth factors. They can grow in suspension. Some of you will appreciate what that means. And you need almost no process control. So that all that means costs, 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 costs come down and down and down. So it's a great way to think about how to do this. And we're fortunate. We have a NASA grant to look at how you're going to feed people going into space to Mars. You need novel ways to do it. And insects are what we put in as the deep space challenge, if you're familiar with that, and won one of the phase one awards with that. We're now in phase two. Um, the other last thing I want to talk about is scaling, uh, and then I want to talk about academics for a minute. Um, scaling is a real big issue here. I've mentioned it a few times. How do we go from a plate of grown fat cells, a plate of grown muscle cells, to producing something you could see in the supermarket shelf as a alternative food? You know, a lot of the startups in the space of cell ag are going back to pharma and looking at how they scale with traditional, what we call stirred tank reactors. It's just a big vat, a bathtub, where you put all the nutrients, put the cells, turn it around, you know, and you hope the cells grow and so on. We are not of the opinion that, that that's going to get us there. I think that's limited to what um, sort of traditional pharma has learned about oxygen diffusion, nutrient uh, diffusion, and so on. So the costs I think for this will remain very, very high. So we have other ways to do this, uh, whether it's 3D printing, hollow fibers, et cetera. These are all things the program here at Tufts is looking at. One of our favorite, though, is to go back to my first slide, which is basically knitting meat, right? And you may think that's crazy, and it probably is, but that's what we're doing. We're literally growing, and this is through a Merck Innovation uh, global award we won last year. It's a three-year grant to prove out what we call textile-based bioreactors to scale cultured meat in a way that no one's done before. So we're, we're excited to do that. It's underway. Happy to talk more about that with anyone. All right, let me just close to say we, we do a lot of education. Obviously, we're at a university, so we already have for two years now offered both lecture-based courses in cell ag. We also have lab-based hands-on courses in cell ag, and we also now have a new graduate certificate program in cell ag that's, that's brought over the entire university. And we also had planned to do this in France at the European campus that Tufts has in Telwar in, in the French Alps, but that got obviously canceled by COVID. We're hoping to reinvigorate this course uh, later this summer or certainly next summer, depending on the global situation. Um, let me close with this and then just some acknowledgments. We are looking at our efforts in what we call this vision for cellular agriculture for the university, uh, covering education, lots of collaborations already underway, and lots of innovation. So we have a lot of work to do, but we're continuing to push ahead. And this involves faculty from the entire campus uh, sort of commonly looking at the challenges ahead and trying to work on these things together. We've been very fortunate between our colleagues here at, at, at the Freeman School as well as at the Vet School to really make some progress in a synergistic way going forward. And we see it's just, just the beginning. So we're pretty excited about this. And we call it now officially the Tufts University Center for Cellular Agriculture, or TUCA. Okay. So let me close, just thank my own group. This is just my PhD and postdocs on the left side. And those are master's students and undergrads who are involved. They come from every department at Tufts just about. So, you know, it doesn't matter where their, their training is. They may want, have an interest in sustainability. They may have an interest in nutrition uh, and so on. And all of them are, are doing really well. Uh, let me just stop there, try to be really quick for Katie. And I'm um, happy to answer. Oh, no, I guess we don't have time for questions, right? So thank you very much. <laughs>